Good morning, guys. You've been asking for it, so here it is. A build review on my Turbo E30 IX. So I'm gonna apologize in advance because I know I'm gonna do a lot of rambling and I'm gonna nerd out because I took a lot of time researching and learning as I went on this turbo build because this is technically my first turbo car that I've owned and the first turbo build that I've ever done, kind of. The turbo setup came out of my other E30iX, which unfortunately I wrecked, so it's my first-ish turbo car. This is my all-wheel drive turbo E30. It's a 91 325iX. You've probably seen it in the other video where I built the five-speed uh, manual to drag gearbox in this car. These E30s are pretty cool because it was basically BMW's first attempt at an all-wheel drive car. And I shouldn't say attempt because they nailed it. This car is great in the snow, unstoppable in any weather condition, and I daily drive it through all of it. And as you can see, I've got my winter tires on because it's still winter here. Another fact that makes these cars unique is they're kind of rare. Um, there's a bunch of different numbers floating around on the internet, but they only made roughly 35,000 of these in all-wheel drive form and about 8,000 of them only made it to North America. So it's cool because you don't see them all the time, but on the other hand, it sucks whenever you have to find parts that are specific to the all-wheel drive system on this car. Um, the rest of the car shares parts with the rear-wheel drive platform. But anyway, that's enough history. We're here to talk about the turbo setup. I went into this build with a mindset of trying to do everything right the first time. So I didn't have to spend time upgrading and repairing parts as I went because the goal was to have a reliable and fun daily driver. So far, it's been a pretty solid setup. Right, so here's where most of the turbo setup lives. And we might as well start with the heart of the whole system, the turbo. Right, so here's the turbo. It's a GT3582 Chinese clone turbo from eBay. And so far it's been a solid turbo. Um, it reaches max boost, I'd say around three to 3,500 RPMs. And it's great for a street car. I've been running this turbo for about two years and I'm super satisfied with it. Um, it hasn't blown up, it's not smoking, the seals aren't blown out, and even if that happens, all I have to do is go on eBay and, you know, buy another $150 turbo. So before this turbo, I had a Holset HX35 turbo on this setup and, you know, I, I went with that turbo because that's what a lot of people start with. But I think it's a great turbo. It's just a little too big for a street car. It would probably reach max boost around four to 4,500, which would probably be great for a high horsepower drag car. But I wanted something a little bit more responsive for the street and, you know, something that would be good for autocross, something that just spool up and deliver the power quickly. I also replaced the whole sit because one day I was doing a bunch of hard pulls and it finally let loose. Um, what happened is the nut on the compressor wheel on this side of the turbo let loose and then the wheel ended up seizing in the compressor bore here and I was making no boost. Um, it was kind of a funny situation, but that's why I ended up with this turbo. So before we go any further, let's talk about some numbers here. Um, I'm running 16 to 17 PSI, you know, kind of depending on the temperature uh, on this turbo. And uh, I haven't dynoed this whole setup, but from seeing other people's similar builds with similar parts, I would say 
without a doubt, this car is putting down at least 300 horsepower to the wheels, if not a little bit more. Uh, it doesn't seem like a whole lot or a crazy number. I can tell you without hesitation that the way this car puts down the power with this turbo and just delivers it through the power band, it's enough to have a lot of fun with, especially in the snow. Um, the only thing I could compare it to would probably be a Subaru WRX STI on steroids. So like with a tune or whatever. So before I go any further, since we're talking about numbers, I should probably talk about what's done to the actual engine itself. Um, and it's easy. The short answer is pretty much hardly anything. Um, the motor's all stock. I basically just refreshed the, all the oil seals, the front and rear crankshaft seals, the valve cover gasket, camshaft seal, new timing belt, tensioner, water pump, stuff like that. Just basic maintenance stuff. But the only other thing I did was add ARP head studs. And I didn't even, I didn't even take the head off the engine to do that. I just pulled out one head bolt at a time and put a ARP head stud in. Greased up the nut, torqued it, and moved on to the next one in the same pattern that the um, factory recommends you tighten the head bolts down. Um, I've seen other guys do this before, and it there hasn't been a single issue from doing it that way. So uh, just a heads up there, just ARP head studs. And also before I go any further, I want to let you guys know that I've linked a spreadsheet that I've made and added to over the years in the description and it goes over all the parts that I've bought for this car the prices where to buy them so you guys can reference that and check it out um, especially if I've missed anything in the video and just check out all the little parts and pieces like hose fittings and stuff like that it's all in there so go ahead and check that out all right so moving on let's talk about the turbo manifold and it's gonna be kind of hard to see because I've just recently added these uh, heat shields for my spark plug wires, but there she is. I'm gonna jack this car up in a minute to show you some of the stuff underneath and we can get a better look at it then. So this manifold in particular is a DIY PSI model from Classic Daily. And I bought it because it was one of the more available turbo manifolds at the time. I've been running this thing for, I'd say about five years total. It's a great manifold, um, but I did have to take care of some issues right off the bat with it. So after I bought this manifold, I immediately installed it after getting it in the mail, and I found out that I had a huge exhaust leak right in the middle of the flange that bolts to the head. And so I was kind of bummed. I immediately took it off and found that, in fact, the turbo manifold flange that bolts to the head, like I was saying, was warped in the middle. And I'm pretty sure that was from the welding process. They didn't use a big enough heat sink when they were welding this thing up on their jig. So anyways, I got a hold of Classic Daily and they advised me to take it to my machine shop and that they would pay for the cost to have them machine it flat. So that's what I did. And uh, that, that took care of that issue right away. Slapped it back on, had absolutely no leaks, worked great. And still works great. Um, I'd say it's a great manifold. The only other downside is it's hard to tighten the, the mounting bolts down just because of the way that it's constructed. But, I mean, so is the stock manifold. I don't think you do much about that. The only other gripe I have about it is the wastegate location. So, as you can see, it points down. There's the wastegate down there. So it kind of makes changing springs really difficult because you got to get under there and it's in a tight spot. But 
I don't really have to worry about that anymore because um, I'm using electronic boost control. So uh, more on that in a little bit. Moving on. So speaking of wastegate, let's get underneath the car so we can get a better look at it. So I'm running a Tile MVR 44 millimeter unit and um, obviously have had no issues with it because it's Tile and they've been in the game for about a million years, so they know what they're doing. And side note, these nylon lines with a quick disconnects are so good. They save a lot of time when you are servicing anything to do with a turbo system. And in my experience, anything that saves you time and just makes it easier to service your car and your turbo setup is so worth the money. So I really like these things. You can just reach up, push it in, and pull a hose right out if you've got to service anything. So like I was saying, these nylon hoses with these connectors make everything so much easier. Like if you have to take the compressor housing off or I don't know, just move it out of the way for any reason. You just reach down here, push the little collar in, pull it out, that's it. Put it back in, and you're good to go. So anyways, I'm running electronic boost control. This is my boost controller, it's a Mac valve. It controls boost pressure electronically. So this is wired to my uh, engine management which I'll go over later in this video, but essentially I've got an eight pound spring in my wastegate and that's the lowest boost that I can run. So this just interrupts the signal to it to um, allow me to run a higher boost level, which like I said, I'm running 16 pounds approximately right now. If it gets a little colder, sometimes it spikes up to 17, but Anyway, this is my boost control setup. Back to the turbo. Uh, let's talk oil cooling and water cooling. So um, this turbo uses both oil cooling and water cooling. My whole set was only oil cooled. So when I switched, when I switched over to this, uh, I had to run a couple new lines. I'll talk about that in a sec. So um, here's my oil feed. It starts off underneath. Let me slide under here a sec. So I am running a universal oil filter sandwich plate to get my oil feed. You can see right there, factory location. It's just sandwiched between the oil filter housing and the oil filter. Got the old man filter there. Anyways, um, also running the factory oil cooler still. Right, so oil feed comes off the sandwich plate. Goes up top, comes around here, goes straight into the turbo via a banjo bolt fitting. Um, Kind of saves headroom here but the restrictor is actually in the bolt here and that's important to have on your turbo setup because if you don't restrict the oil pressure going in here you're just going to be running straight engine oil pressure in here and it's going to be too much and then blow out the seals eventually in your turbo and you're going to have smoking out the exhaust so uh it depends on if you have a journal bearing or a ball bearing turbo um, in terms of the size of the restrictor. So this being a journal bearing turbo, it only really needs 
a slight drip of oil going into this. So um, if you want to know the size, it's in the spreadsheet. Like I said, check it out in the description. So um, moving on to the turbo drain. It's gonna be hard to see it from up top again. You can see where it connects to the bottom of the turbo there. And I won't go into it too much because I made a whole video on this ordeal of how I made this um, turbo drain from scratch. It's no longer uh, like braided stainless steel and line. It's solid stainless steel welded to the flange there. And the reason I did that is because, as you can see, it goes right in between those runners there. And when I was running um, stainless braided, uh, it would just get too hot and eventually it would get really stiff and break. So that's why I ended up going to a hard line. But like I said, I've got a whole video on it. Um, watch that, it's a pretty cool video. I'm pretty proud of this piece that I made. I'll jump under here and show you the bottom of it. So down here underneath, you can see where it comes through those two runners down here and ends up terminating to a little bung here where I've got a um, flex section on the end because obviously there's going to be some vibration. Had I made the whole thing a hard line, it probably would have ended up cracking. So as you can see, there's where the end line starts. Got this little nifty heat blanket on it. And there's where it comes down and goes into the block. So I did my turbo drain a little bit differently. Instead of it returning into the oil pan, I drilled and tapped my engine block. So as you can see, that's where it goes back in here towards the back. There's the transmission. So right towards the back here. And I saw a guy do it on the forums a long time ago before I was doing, before I was putting my turbo setup together. So I kept that in mind and copied the same spot that he did. And it's basically on the bottom inch up from the oil pan, essentially. Anyways, that's where I drilled and tapped it. It's a half inch NPT to 10 AN fitting. And that's where my oil drains back into the block. You can definitely tap the oil pan, but I think this is a better solution. And I've actually done it to a couple other um, turbo E30s since then. Also, while I'm under here, I'll show you the difference in the IX oil pan compared to the rear wheel drive. It's way shallower in the front. It doesn't have that big sump that hangs down. So, Right, so water cooling on the turbo. Uh, this wasn't as big a challenge as the oil side of things. So from the factory, these things have a throttle body heater, which I deleted a long time ago, even before my turbo setup. So that's the plug right here. But they have two lines that go to it, two coolant lines. And basically I've just repurposed the connections to them um, for my water cooling on my turbo. Um, this isn't the same spot that it was plumbed into, but, um, the thermostat housing has uh, a couple of these plugs in it. So I got an adapter to this AN line and that's my feed goes into the turbo there and the outlet comes back around snakes down here. And I don't know if we're going to be able to see this, but it's going to go down by the starter there. Maybe I can jump underneath and get a shot of it. But that's where the coolant... Oh, yeah, look at that. Returns into the block 
for the turbo cooling. So that's where the factory spot was for the throttle body heater return. And that's just another fitting that goes into the coolant jacket there. So yeah, works great. It was easy to uh, come up with a water cooling solution for this. So if you guys are putting turbos on your E30 that need water cooling, I would highly recommend going this route. Also, really quick, talking about cooling, uh, I've got this Mishimoto radiator, aluminum radiator, and a electric fan that replaces the uh, stock viscous fan. So, um, again, this is controlled by my engine management to turn on when the car gets above a certain temperature. So, that's basically it for my cooling system. The rest of it's stock. Uh, let's talk about charge pipes. So all my charge piping I made from a two and a half inch uh, CX racing kit. One of the universal ones that come with like a couple 90s and 45s and straight pieces. So um, yeah, don't look too closely. This was my first TIG welding project. So got a little boot adapter here. I believe this is, I'll have to consult the spreadsheet, but I think it's two and three quarter inch to two and a half. Um, I think that's the adapter size, but um, yeah, I relocated the, I didn't necessarily relocate it, but I plumbed the idle air control valve into the charge pipe here and uh, still has a stock location or the stock bracket here. This is my air temperature sensor. It's a GM uh, style sensor and my blow off valve. Uh, another tile unit, quality piece. So following this down, here's where it goes into the side of the intercooler, which is behind my kidney grills. So the intercooler itself is just an eBay aluminum uh, universal unit and it measures out at 27 by nine by two and a half inches. And it's got the inlet and outlet kind of on the bottom there. I'll try to get a picture of what it looks like, but uh, I went with this setup for a couple of reasons. Uh, the most important one is I wanted to keep AC. So had I put it down here, it would have been in the way of the condenser. The charge pipes would have been in the way of the um, compressor. So this way I got to retain AC by putting in this location. Um, it's big enough for the boost that I'm running. I've never had any... Um, overly hot intake temperatures. I mean, this the intake air hardly ever gets over like 100 degrees. So you can put it down there, but you're also looking at getting rid of your oil cooler, which isn't a huge deal. But if you want to keep AC, that's the spot for it. And come on, I'm not going to lie, it looks sweet. So the only real modification I did to it was weld a 90 on the side of it and that's just so I could basically get a coupler on and off easily because if it was down in there I'd have to take like the headlight out and the grill etc etc just to get this thing taken apart so that's just for serviceability like I was saying I kept AC so here's my AC lines coming around uh, I had to make a custom AC line here because I'm not running the stock compressor. I'm running a universal sand in unit, but I won't get too in depth with that because we're talking about the turbo and not the AC, but 
If you guys are interested in retaining your AC in your E30, let me know. I could probably make a separate video on that. So anyways, here's the other side of the charge piping. Comes right out of the intercooler, like I was saying, and goes into the turbo. I guess this would be out of the turbo. But yeah, pretty simple. I wanted to keep the number of couplers down, you know, just to minimize boost leaks and, you know, couplers blowing off. So it's pretty simple. So this is the intake side, uh, little four inch bend here, Canon filter, and uh, let's talk about my crankcase breather while we're here. So from the factory, the crankcase breather hose connects to this port on the valve cover, goes underneath the intake manifold, and then connects to a port that used to be here on the throttle body, right in the middle of the uh, throttle body heater. And that's actually why the throttle body's here. Heater was there is to keep the crankcase vapors from freezing up. So anyway, I've blocked that off. And the reason that you want to do that is if you don't, your boost pressure is going to come in here and it's going to go into the engine and also into your crankcase breather. Come in here and it's going to pressurize your engine block. So that's bad because it's going to push all your main oil seals out so you want to take a different approach when you're turboing it and this is the easiest approach um you can connect back up to here i opted to move my crankcase breather uh kind of forward here so i didn't have hoses chilling under the manifold so i welded a little bung on top of the valve cover and i've got a I believe 12 an hose going right to the pre-turbo intake side of the intake here, basically. Um, there's another bung right here. So what's going on here is, is the air's being sucked in the turbo. It's creating a vacuum on here. So this is also pulling a vacuum or at least getting the pressure out of the engine to maintain low crankcase pressures. And it's a pretty simple design. Uh, every once in a while, I'll get a little bit of oil in here. So in the future, I'm going to add a catch can in between here. So anybody else watching this that has turbo E30, let me know how your setup differs from mine. Um, this works okay, but like I said, every once in a while, get a little oil sucked in there. But yeah, catch can coming soon. So as I was talking about earlier, I've just recently added these uh, heat shields. So uh, I made them out of roofing flashing, just aluminum roofing flashing, and that gold heat tape that you can find on Amazon or eBay or whatever. Uh, I just added these because plastic stuff was starting to get hot and a little bit melty after hard pulls, especially my washer tank here and also my spark plug wires. So, I've got those little boots on them too. But yeah, I might refine it in the future, but essentially just some heat protection for now. All right, let's talk fuel system really quick. It's pretty simple. I'm running Injector Dynamics ID1050X injectors for my injectors. Uh, they're pretty huge but they also idle well, and that's what Injector Dynamics is known for. They make really good injectors, and they look freaking sweet because they're purple. The only other thing that I've done to the fuel system is refresh the fuel lines and installed a Deutschworks uh, 340 liter per hour fuel pump on the stock fuel pump hanger and that is it the fuel pressure regulator is stock haven't really had a reason to upgrade it yet but that is it for the fuel system okay ignition system um right off the bat i got rid of the stock distributor coil wires all that and went straight to GM Wasted Spark. 
So I did this for several reasons. Um, these are super easy to find, super cheap. Components are way cheaper than the factory stuff, way more powerful. Um, these things come on a lot of late 90s, early 2000s GM cars with V6s. So I just went to the junkyard, grabbed the base plate, coils, ton of extras. Uh, I think I got it from a Grand Prix, but uh, I'm not going to go over how I wired this up. I can make a video on it if you guys want or link it up. Um, this is controlled by my engine management that uh, I'll talk about in a minute. So these wires are a universal MSD kit. So it comes with, you know, lengths of wire, these boots, and they've got straight boots on the bottom. So all I did was um, measure them out, terminate them, and put them in there. So here's where the distributor used to be. I've got the block off plate by Bimmerheads in here. It's got a cam sensor in here. It is not hooked up. That's gonna be for the future when I run full sequential, but like I said, I don't need that right now. It's just here to cover up the spot that the distributor used to sit on. I'm also running one heat range colder spark plugs. Um, they're NG case. I believe the part number is BKR7ES and I've got them gapped down to 23 thousandths to prevent spark blow up. So uh, the cool thing about those plugs is they're like $5 each and you can get them anywhere. I just get mine at Napa. So super cheap to replace and they work great. So moving on, obviously this setup cannot run on the factory ECU, especially with wasted spark, huge injectors, you know, turbo boost, no AFM, airflow meter. So let's talk about engine management. Okay, so right here where the stock ECU used to live is a Megasquirt 2 plug and play. And I bought this from DIY Auto Tune. And it wasn't actually the assembled one, it was the DIY version. So it came with all the kit, it came with all the components, and you had to solder it all together. So I went with this because it's got the factory plug on it. And I really didn't feel like rewiring my uh, factory harness. So that was nice because it just plugs right in. And I've kind of made like a little holder for it. So it's not sit around here flopping around, banging into stuff. But uh, yeah, like I said, it sits right where the stock ECU used to sit. And uh, wearing's still a little bit messy. I've got the uh, Innovate. LC2 wideband also in here and you'll see that um, screwed into my downpipe when I show you the exhaust but yeah I've also added a Bluetooth module to the Mega Squirt and I did that because the USB uh, tuning kind of got old you know running a cable to my laptop so now I can tune without having to plug into this. And it's got some pretty crazy range on it. Um, I could be outside the car about 15 feet away and still be connected to the Megasquirt on my laptop. So it's pretty handy. I'm not really running any crazy gauges or anything in here. I'm just running a AFR gauge in the um, onboard computer location or like where a clock would be on some models. Um, it's just nice little 3D printed gauge pod and that's the only gauge I'm running so that's almost it uh, there's a couple more things the clutch the clutch isn't stock it's a clutch masters stage 2 you probably saw it in the transmission reassembly video uh, where I put the transmission back on the car uh, it's a great clutch it's a little heavier on the pedal but other than that it's pretty smooth and it holds the power well so I think we've only got one more thing to talk about, and that is the exhaust. The entire exhaust is three inch mild steel. It's not stainless steel. And I built this thing a long time ago and haven't really modified it since. Uh, it's all V-banded. So it's V-banded right here at the turbo. 
and down at the end of the downpipe. So the downpipe goes down here, kind of hugs the firewall. There's the wideband oxygen sensor right there. It's got a little nice flex section in here. Comes down, another V-band, and connects to the rest of the exhaust. So since we're talking about exhaust, I should mention that the wastegate exhaust pipe isn't welded into the rest of the exhaust. So it's just a screamer pipe. So, you know, once that wastegate opens up, it gets really loud. So like I was saying, I made this exhaust a long time ago. Um, it used to be a lot more clean, but I daily drive this car. So it's gonna rust, especially for being mild steel. Someday I'd like to remake it in stainless steel. But anyway, I made this whole exhaust from three inch pipe, uh, sections of straight pieces and a couple mandrel bends. And when I ran out of mandrel bends, I did a bunch of pie cuts. So essentially there's just a resonator in here, straight through resonator to take any buzz out of the system, any buzzing noises. And uh, it goes back to a Dynamax chambered muffler. So it kind of quiets it down a little bit, but doesn't restrict the flow uh, as it is a performance muffler. So. It is chambered, it's not straight through, and from there it goes into custom tips that I welded onto it to look like the uh, stock setup on E30s. So it's got the two little tips that come out on a slight angle with kind of like a little slash cut in it. And this is actually the first exhaust, for, first full custom exhaust I've ever made, and I'm still pretty happy with it. Sounds great, and um, not a whole lot of back pressure. So guys, that pretty much wraps up the whole build. Um, if I missed anything, let me know. And be sure to check out that spreadsheet that I've linked in the description. So you can check out, you know, every single part and price that went into this and can kind of help you if you're putting together your own turbo kit. Um, I've got a lot of future plans for this and it's mostly in terms of more power, more boost, upgraded engine management um, for better drivability. So that'll be coming soon. All right, guys, let me know what you think down below. And definitely let me know if you want to know more about something. Um, if you like this type of video, please subscribe. It helps me out, and I'd like to make a lot more of them. So all right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.